through uh, our dynamic equilibrium unit review. Um, the computer crashed uh, as I was working through my solution for part 9a. Uh, so in interest of time, actually, I'm actually going to hope that the solutions that I've written out so far for tracing our steps along uh, are going to be sufficient for you to follow along and figure out uh, what happens to the pH. I'm going to finish my thought here, though. Uh, so just to clarify here, we decide as we de question asks if we decrease hydrogen gas, how will that affect the pH? And pH is uh, going to be concerned with the concentration of hydroxide. So this is going to be our pH term here. That's the one that uh, we're concerned with. So I recommended we do a few things to organize our thoughts. First is uh, label each of the equilibria, equilibrium 1, equilibrium 2, equilibrium 3. And uh, then highlight the species that show up in multiple equilibria, because it, whenever one increases or decreases the other, increases or decreases in tandem because they describe the same thing. Okay. And then we started by saying, okay, well, if we have a, a decrease in hydrogen gas concentration. Okay, well, what's that going to do? Well, that's going to shift our first equilibrium, equilibrium 1, to the reactants. Uh, and the uh, reactants in turn will, oh, sorry, as we shift to the reactants, it's going to decrease the amount of ammonia in our gas form. Now, the ammonia in our gas form is in both the first and second equilibrium. So as that decreases in concentration, it's going to cause a decrease in our aqueous ammonia concentration. Uh, and that is also in our third equilibrium, and that's going to shift that equilibrium to the reactants to cause a decrease in the concentration of hydroxide. Okay, so we're not quite done. We can see that pH increases as the hydroxide concentration increases, so as hydroxide decreases, the pH must decrease. And so we can conclude that pH will decrease. Okay. So we're going to see if we can uh, take a look at question B and apply a similar logic. All right, so 9B says uh, we have an increase in aqueous ammonia. Increase in aqueous ammonia. And then we're asked two things here. We're asked how will that affect the pH and how will it affect the nitrogen concentration? All right, so uh, we can do either. We can start with, let's start with the pH. Okay. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm increasing the concentration of my ammonia, my aqueous form. So that is uh, this one here and this one here. They're both increasing in this case, so I'm going to draw a little black increase here. Okay, so if that increases, so what's that going to lead to? Well, it's going to lead to, well, what do I want, where do I want to go? Do I want to learn about this guy, or how does it react this equilibrium? Well, I'm concerned about pH in this question. So pH, this is my pH term here. I'm going to, it's intricately linked to hydroxide concentration. So if I want to know about pH, I've got to ask about this hydroxide term. So as my ammonia concentration increases in its aqueous form, that's going to shift this equilibrium, 3, shifts to the uh, products, in turn increasing the concentration of hydroxide. And uh, then we can say, oh, pH increases as hydroxide increases. So as we increase in this guy, that's going to lead to an increase in pH. However, this increase in ammonia, we were also asked how it affected the nitrogen gas. So now we're going to trace it back to find out about the nitrogen gas. Okay, uh, so as we increase our aqueous ammonia, it's going to shift, also shift equilibrium 2 to the reactants. And that's going to increase 
the amount of ammonia in gas form. Now that is in, also found, so it's going to increase it. So I'm going to also found here in uh, this first equilibria, that's going to cause a sh equilibrium one to shift to, well, as we increase the amount of one product, it's going to try to minimize that increase, so it's going to shift equilibrium to the reactants. And well, nitrogen is a reactant, so that's going to cause an increase in concentration of nitrogen. Uh, nope. Okay, and that's our final answer. All right. So let's move on here. Uh, we'll take a look at question 11. All right. Question 11. All right, we're given a reaction and we're told it's exothermic. We have a negative here. Gives off energy as it proceeds. All right, so we're asked a series of questions here. So, okay, so 11a. First, with reference to enthalpy and entropy, explain why we think this reaction should exist in equilibrium. Okay, let's we'll start with enthalpy. So, our enthalpy reaction, I'm going to write that as a word. Enthalpy. So if we know this reaction as a delta H, which is negative 92 kilojoules every mole, so that tells us that if we picture this reaction, we can see it's losing negative 92 kilojoules for every mole of bond energy in our uh, reactants. So N2 and 3H2. I'm going to go down to 2 ammonia. And in so doing, they, this means we're going to lose bond energy. So what can we say here? We say the reactants have a minimum enthalpy. And uh, then we can make an entropy argument. So we can say there are four gas species in equilibrium with uh, two gas species. And so this has a higher entropy on the reactant side. So that means the, oops, I said reactants. Sorry, that should be products. So there's a fundamental force shift pushing this reaction forward. And blue and black don't really pop out as different colors. It kind of looks like I'm using the same color there. I'm going to try green for the next one. And so the reactants have a higher entropy. Maximum entropy. So that shift pushes things to the left, to the reactants. Okay. And uh, the entropy and enthalpy are in opposition therefore the reaction exists in equilibrium all right uh, moving on to question B 11 B all right so the goal of the Haber process which is uh, this reaction, uh, is to make ammonia, because we use it for fertilizer, from the nitrogen, the free nitrogen gas in the air. So if we're not adding any ac extra reactants or products, and based on all we know, can we suggest two different ways that we could change conditions so we'll increase the con creation of ammonia? Okay, so how can we shift equilibrium uh, so that more ammonia is created. Well, I guess we have, if we can have three ways of manipulating equilibrium using Le Chatelier's principle. One is uh, we can increase concentration or decrease concentration of one of the uh, reactants. We can also increase and decrease the volume and pressure 
Okay, and lastly, we can increase or decrease the temperature. So if we're not adding reactants or products, that means the only things we have to play with are temperature and pressure. Okay, so I know this is exothermic, so that means uh, that 92 kilojoules is a reactant for every mole. Okay, uh, so if I want to make more ammonia, uh, okay, so I need to know which of these sides is uh, exothermic. That's exothermic, and but it's endothermic in this direction. So if I want to increase the amount of this ammonia, that means I want to push this reaction in the exothermic direction. So if I push this reaction in the exothermic direction to make more of this stuff, that's got to be a Le Chatelet's principal response to something. And it would be a response to a decrease in temperature. It would lead to an increase in uh, NH3 gas concentration. That's one key idea. We can also manipulate pressure. Now, to do that, I need to know what's the high and low pressure and so, uh, side. So it looks like there's four gases over here. So this is high pressure. This is low pressure. Because there's only two gases here. So uh, if I want to shift this to the right, I uh, want to... The reaction is going to decrease in pressure by shifting to the right. And so uh, that must be in response to an increase in pressure, which causes a an increase in the low pressure system. And it's this, to respond to high pressure, we're going to try to decrease uh, these pressures, so these reactions are going to reactants are going to combine and form products, and increase the amount of ammonia. Okay, that's it. That's all we have to do for that answer. We've suggested two different changes. An increase in temperature, or a, oh, pardon me, I'm going to try that again, a decrease in temperature, or an increase in pressure, should uh, theoretically uh, increase the ammonia created. Now, it turns out that's not, well, I mean, it is true in theory. Uh, the problem is that this is such a slow reaction. If we decrease the temperature, it reacts so much more slowly. Uh, so in reality, when we do the hyper process, we don't decrease the temperature. Uh, but we do increase the pressure quite a bit. Uh, okay. So let's move on to question C. Question C says, write the equilibrium constant expression for this uh, Reaction, okay, that's pretty straightforward. Okay, so it's an equilibrium constant expression. We gotta make sure to write the product concentration squared over the uh, nitrogen times the hydrogen gas cubed. Oops, I'm not recording any of that. Uh, and it's C here, that's an equilibrium constant for this expression. Pretty straightforward stuff there. All right, so question D says equilibrium constant for this reaction at room temperature 640. Given this equilibrium constant, are the reactants or products more favorable at room temperature? Well, if Keq, or equilibrium constant, is always a concentration of our products over our reactants, well, uh, if that ratio, that fraction, simplifies to 640, that means I have really big product concentration over a really small reactant concentration. Because, I mean, I can think about oops, how I can get a number like 640 by dividing things. Uh, say 1,280 over 2. So that's a big product over a small reactant. Well, that gives me 640. Uh, but any number, if you divide them, that's a division, right? And it gives you 640 means the number on top, the products, must be much bigger. 
this reaction favors the products. So products are favored. Okay. Now, let's move on to question E. Okay. Uh, demonstrate that your answer to 11D, which is this last one, is correct with a thought experiment. So we're uh, what would the equilibrium concentrations of nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia be at room temperature if you added 8 moles of ammonia? So what would equilibrium concentrations of nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia be at room temperature if we added 8 moles of ammonia uh, to a, an empty two liter bulb. All right, so this is interesting. It looks like I'm asked for some equilibrium concentration. And I'm given an initial concentration before equilibrium is reached. So what does that tell me? That tells me that we're gonna need a rice box. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to start with a rice box, okay. So this tells me, uh, what do I have here? I've got some nitrogen, some hydrogen, and that's in equilibrium with uh, ammonia. I'm not going to include gases, they are all gases at the, I guess at room temperature. All right, and so what do we know? Uh, we know we're adding eight moles of ammonia initially. And uh, so I only put concentrations in here, so that means that 8 moles over. So concentration of ammonia initially is 8.00 moles over 2.00 liters, which is 4.00 molar. That number goes here, 4.00, that's the initial concentration. And I don't have any ammonia, pardon me, I don't have any nitrogen or hydrogen initially. The question is, well, how much are we going to have left over? Uh, well, let's find out. So I know I'm going to lose some amount of ammonia. But I'm actually going to say I'm going to lose two x's of ammonia. The reason for that is because there's a ratio of two to one. And if for every two moles of ammonia I lose, I'm going to create a mole of nitrogen. How do I know I'm losing instead of gaining it? Because Le Chatelier's principle says that uh, if we increase the amount of these products, which we just did, we're going to shift and form some reactants. So also with these molar ratios, uh, for every one nitrogen molecule, we're going to gain three hydrogen molecules. So we'll gain three X there. Okay. And so that tells me that we're going to have uh, X and twos, three X, Hydrogens and four, take away two X, ammonia. Uh, these are all concentrations per liter, moles per liter. Um, okay, and so then we go to an equilibrium expression, right? That's uh, what we always do here. So uh, we're going to take a look at our reactants here, or products here. So that's four point, I should say 4.00, take two X. And we're going to have to square that, because that was my equilibrium expression, right? Up here. And then I'm going to take the nitrogen value here. So it's going to be concentration nitrogen. And the concentration of hydrogen is 3x uh, squared cubed. Oh, God, cubed. OK. Uh-oh. <laughs> Cube, that's going to be interesting. Let's find out what happens here. All right. Uh, so, OK. And I know my equilibrium constant is uh, 640. So, OK, I'm going to write it over here so I have a bit more room to work. So it says 640 is equal to 4 minus 2x squared over 4. So if I multiply these all together, I get... 3x times 3x times 3x 
is 3x cubed. Or, pardon me, 27x cubed. And uh, that's all times x. So x times 2x times 2x times 3x is 27x power 4. Oh, God. Okay. So uh, first thing we should do is square root both sides. And so that's going to, let's find out what the square root of 640 is. It's 25.29. So let's say 25.3. And this can be equal to the square root of this guy, so it's going to be 4, take away 2x on the top. And I get the square root of 27, whatever that is, x squared. Oh, man. That's going to be a hard question to answer. It's going to require a quadratic formula. Okay. Um, let's see how we can do this here. I don't want to use a quadratic formula. So I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to show you what it would look like anyway. Root 27 times x squared. I'll multiply both sides. All right, and so that's going to give us 27, root 27, times 25.3, which gives us 131x squared is equal to 4, take away 2x. I would get everything to one side, so that means I'd have 131x squared plus 2x minus 4 is all equal to 0. Let these be A, B, and C. And I would then put into my quadratic formula, x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And uh, then say, okay, well, x is equal to negative 2 plus or minus 2 squared is 4 minus 4 times 131 times negative 4. It's all over two a's, so 262. It's uh, negative two. Uh, okay, we'll leave that. So let's find out what this is. So it's four minus four times 130. Oops, 31 times negative four, and we're going to square root that. It's going to give us 48. 45.8. So x is equal to negative 2 plus or minus 45.8, all over 262. Now one of those is going to give us a negative value, negative 2 take away 48.5.8. Uh, don't have a 262, gives us a negative number, so we're going to discard that. Uh, you know what, uh, this is getting a little messy. Alright, so I'm going to say please discard. Uh, my mistake. This question is too hard, and uh, I promise I won't ask you a question like this on the test because it needs a quadratic formula for solving. Uh, huh, I was not expecting that, but I can see why it happened. So, um, if you want to practice this process of using a rice table, I, you have a lot of rice table practice on your, uh, that you have access to, so I would suggest doing any of those questions to help to prepare for that, especially the ones on the second sheet, the more challenging ones. All right, so apologize for that. Let's move on to question uh, 3F. All right, so... 3F asks, how does a decrease in temperature affect the value of KQ? Okay, so, oh, sorry, 11F. That says, uh, how does an increase in temperature, a decrease in temperature, decrease in temperature? Okay, so if this reaction is exothermic, N2 plus 3H2, 2N plus 92 kilojoules, 
exothermal. And if we decrease the temperature, and we know this is an exothermic direction, this is an endothermic direction. So de decreasing temperature is going to shift equilibrium to, so if you decrease temperature, we're going to want to go in the exothermic direction, so we're going to increase the products to recreate this, uh, some extra heat and minimize that change. So we're going to shift equilibrium to products. So what does that mean? That means the concentration of products will increase. Concentration of reactants will decrease. The question is, how does that affect our value of the equilibrium constant? Well, our equilibrium constant, Keq, is our concentration of our products over the concentration of our reactants. Now, if our concentration of our products increases and our concentration of our reactants decreases, that means we have a fraction where the number on top, the numerator, is getting bigger, and the number on the bottom, the denominator, is getting smaller. So this means that the Keq value increases. So uh, a decrease in temperature will increase the value for Keq. Okay. So let's move on. Let's uh, finish this stuff off here. All right, it's question 12. It says uh, we have a reaction and it's a uh, reached equilibrium, it's reached equilibrium at a, in a five liter vessel. That sounds important. And will the re reaction that's a typo, weird. All right, so question one asks us a asks us to write the equilibrium constant expression. The expression is really just the concentration of the reactants, PCl3, over the concentration of our reactants. B asks, okay, if uh, you know some concentrations or some number of moles at equilibrium, what's the value of the equilibrium constant for this reaction? at that temperature. Okay, uh, well, to do that we need to know the concentration of PCl3. That's going to be uh, six tenths of a mole for every five liters, which is I think point three. No, nope. that's what calculators are for. Uh, the concentration of chlorine is, um, what do we have here? Okay, so we have uh, 0 0.25 moles for every 5 liters, which is 0 0.05, 0 0.25, 0 0.05, 0 0.05 molar, and the concentration of PCl5, phosphorus pentachloride, is, uh, oh, Mix it up here. So actually, that's the concentration of phosphorus pentachloride. And we want to be able to find the concentration of chlorine here, uh, which is 0 0.150 moles for every 5 liter. 0 0.15 divided by 5, 0 0.03. Okay. So we just take these values and put them into our expression here. And we say PCl3 concentration is 0 0.12. And we're going to leave out the units because uh, the units get a little funky with these calculations. And then just see what we get. 0 0.03 times 0 0.12. Oops. Uh, 0 0.12. I don't trust that. So 0 0.12 times 0 0.03. There we go. Divided by 0 0.05. And it gives us 0 
that's equal to our KQ. All right. So 13 asks one content knowledge question, one foundation skills question, one 3C question. All right. Um, all right, last question, I think, uh, before we call it. We'll see if we can get through both of these. All right. Uh, so 13. All right, so what do we have here? Uh, we have an equilibrium expression. We know there are 0 0.80 moles of nitrogen monoxide and 0 0.60 moles of chlorine gas, and they're placed into a one liter container, and they establish equilibrium. And then at equilibrium, our concentration of NOCl, NOCl, is 0 0.06056 molar. So means these are initial concentrations. And this is an equilibrium concentration. And when we uh, are comparing initial and equilibrium values, well, that means we're going to be making a rice table. Okay. Now, that isn't quite what we were asked to begin with. We are just asked first, what is the equilibrium constant expression? Okay. So that's uh, pretty straightforward. So, um, so question 13a. Equilibrium expression, our constant expression is going to be our concentration of, of our uh, reactants, which are our knuckles, squared, because there's two of them, and over the concentration of our nitrogen monoxide squared times the concentration of our chlorine. And that's that. That's the whole answer. And then question B asks, what's the equilibrium constant for this reaction? All right. So to know that, we're going to have to recognize that uh, we know don't know all of our equilibrium values. We know the equilibrium value for our NOCl, uh, but we don't know our equilibrium values for nitrogen monoxide and chlorine. So in order to do that, we're going to need to find our equilibrium values for each of those. So that's our NO plus our Cl2 in reaction. At, oh, double uh, with two NOCls. Okay. So what do I know? I know my initial concentration of nitrogen monoxide is 0 0.8 moles per liter, but the, constant, the volume is a one liter container, so we don't need to change this value. Uh, concentration of chlorine is 0 0.6, and we start with no NOCl. Now we're going to end up with 0 0.56 molar NCL. So then we added a 0 0.56. The change was a 0 0.56 molar concentration change of NOCl. And that must mean we must have lost 0 0.56 moles molar. And we must have lost uh, half as much of that, negative uh, 0 0.28, of chlorine because there's a 1 to 2 ratio. Half as many nitrogen monoxides, pardon me, half as many chlorines as our nitrogen monoxides. Gives us some values. Eight, I think that's 0 0.24, and we get 0 0.32. And now we have equilibrium concentrations of each of these substances. So now we can go to find our KEQ. Our equilibrium constant is uh, it's the concentration of nitrogen uh, NOCl, which is 0 0.56 squared, over the concentration of our NO, 0.24 squared, times the concentration of our chlorine, which is 0 0.32. That's all equal to a number, which is uh, 0 0.56 power of 2, divided by 0 0.24 to the power of 2, and that's all divided by 0 0.32. So an equilibrium constant of 17.0. So equilibrium constant is 17.0 for this reaction, meaning it favors the products more than the reactants by a factor of 17. All right, last question. How would increasing or decreasing the temperature lead to an increase in NOCl? Oh, so would, sorry, not how would, 
would increasing or decreasing the temperature lead to an increase in NOCl? And we're given a little hint. Uh, if this is an equilibrium, can you make a conclusion about whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic? So that's a big hint here. Okay, so we know it's in equilibrium. So that means if we go back, way back, and we look at our answer for question number five, and we say, okay, we went over and reminded ourselves that uh, we have three conditions, right? Our reaction could proceed 100%. And if that's true, either our, uh, our reaction is exothermic, but our products also have uh, most random products or most random particles in the product side, maximum entropy for the products, and a minimum enthalpy for the products. And that's what it means to react 100%. But if you're in equilibrium, there's two possibilities. Either the uh, products have a minimum enthalpy and are exothermic, and the reactants have the ma maximum entropy, or vice versa, the reactants have a minimum enthalpy and the reaction is endothermic, and the products have a maximum entropy or, or exothermic. So our possibilities here are either that this reaction is exothermic, and if it is, then the reactants have a more random phase, right? or pardon me, a more random uh, value, more, more entropy, is I guess what I'm trying to say. All right, so either Okay, so the reaction is in equilibrium. Therefore, either uh, the products have a minimum enthalpy and the reactant Reactants have a maximum entropy. That's one possibility. So that means we're pushing this way and this way. Or our products have a maximum enthalpy. Or no, so we should probably rephrase that to say our reactants have. A minimum enthalpy, but our products have a max entropy. In other words, we're pushing toward our reactants with our enthalpy argument, or pushing toward our products with our entropy argument. And so what does this mean? If your products have a minimum enthalpy, that means you are, have a reaction like this. This is exothermic. And if we have a reaction where the reactants have a minimum enthalpy, it looks like this, and this is endothermic. Okay. So either one of these is true. But if we look at this reaction, we, don't, we aren't told anything about whether it's endothermic or exothermic. Uh, but we can make a conclusion about whether the reaction is endothermic or exothermic based on the fact that it's in equilibrium and we can make a, an entropy conclusion. Either the reactants have a maximum entropy or the products have a maximum entropy. One of them does. If the reactants have a maximum entropy, then it must be exothermic. If the products have a maximum entropy, it must be endothermic. So if we look, where's the maximum entropy? The maximum entropy is on the reactant side. So if we look, we say, oh, the reactants have a maximum en entropy. This is not true that the products have a maximum entropy. So as a result, this reaction is exothermic. So we can say, since uh, the reactants have a maximum entropy. Mm -hmm. 
the reaction is exothermic. Exothermic. All right. Now we're not done. We weren't asked if it was exothermic. We were asked, would you increase the temperature or decrease the temperature to lead to an increase in NOCL? So, uh, let's just see. This is exothermic, we just uh, confirmed, so that means 2NO plus Cl2 plus give us 2NOCl plus some energy term. We know that this is an exothermic reaction, and the backwards reaction is endothermic. Okay, and so would you increase the temperature to increase this guy? Well, if you increase the temperature, it's going to make the reaction want to go in the endothermic direction, decreasing the amount of nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, I forget how to say that. So if you decrease the temperature, it's going to lead to an equilibrium shift to reactants, which leads to a decrease in the N concentration of NOCl. Oh, but we don't want to, <laughs> sorry, uh, and that means an increase in temperature because we want to increase this guy. It's going to lead to an equilibrium shift to the products. And that's going to cause an increase in our knuckle. And that's our final answer for this one. Okay. We're going to pick up 14 tomorrow because uh, I'm sure I'm going to get kicked out of the building soon. Let me know if you have any questions about any of these.